How's that? All right. Welcome to some of you Community Church. My name is Mike Bonnell. Still. We're uh, glad you're here. So uh, we're, right now we're going through the book of First Peter, and uh, it's been a great study so far. And uh, typically the first Sundays of the month, we take a break from our, uh, our, our teaching through the Word and uh, address something that's kind of maybe hitting us where we're at right now, uh, maybe just something that's really pressing on our hearts. So have an opportunity to do that today. And uh, as I was thinking through the, the message for today, I'm just kind of reflecting on the weird year that's been 2020. It's been a strange year. Uh, I've heard many people say it's maybe the worst year ever, right? The pandemic, the global unrest, racial tensions, there's riots, there's a lot of massive unemployment, uncontrolled forest fires. Uh, it's a mixed, it's an election year, which just compounds things all the more. We're getting mixed messages from the World Health Organization about dealing with the pandemic. The Center for Disease Control has different messages or has sent different messages. Politicians and media, are, are, we've got mixed messages there. Uh, there's, there's mixed messages on law enforcement and what they're doing and what they're not doing. There's, we've lost credibility, it seems like, as a, in the world, in the country. There's, uh, I, I feel like it's been severely damaged. And uh, leaves us kind of asking questions, like, who's speaking truth? Who can I trust? What can we even be sure of? And uh, so many things that seemed certain only a few months ago. Uh, we're, we're questioning now. It's, uh, it's really been shaken. There's this, just a strong sense of uncertainty at the least, and in many cases a sense of hopelessness and maybe impending doom for some. So it's, at the very least, it's uh, uncertainty. So, and for some of us, compounding on that uncertainty that we're dealing with the global area or, or the, uh, the, the more local external forces that are in our lives, we look at our own families, and we have a lot of dysfunction maybe there, some broken marriages, some maybe challenges with children, maybe job loss, uh, physical illness, perhaps mental illness, um, other things going on in the home that are contributing to that. So anyway, just a, we're living in a time of uncertainty, and uh, there have been other times that have arguably worse, but it's, it's probably the most the highest level of uncertainty that I've, I've lived in my lifetime. Um, there's been talk about it being the worst year ever. Could 2020 be the worst year ever? Think about Annie. Um, when I was growing up, I didn't watch it very much. Very little, actually. The movie Annie. Many of you see, have seen the movie Annie. Cute little story. Um, but she sings this song that says, The sun will come out tomorrow. And bet your bottom dollar tomorrow, whatever. It's always tomorrow. It's always a day away, right? And, and you want me to sing it, yeah. I'm not, Paul could pull that off, not me. Um, but tomorrow is always a day away, so just hang in there, because tomorrow is going to come. And uh, it's interesting, what if the sun didn't come out tomorrow, or the next day, or for the next 18 months? It's actually what happened in the year 536. And the History Channel, or the, uh, um, it's actually not the History Channel, but the Weird History Channel, if you will, calls the year 536 as the worst year to have lived through. Here's why. And uh, since, since then, no one had any idea this was going on, but researchers discovered that in the year 536, there were, there's evidence of two massive volcanic eruptions that occurred in Iceland, one, was in, one in North America and also one in El Salvador. So the ensuing volcanic ash just wreaked havoc on the entire world. And uh, no one living at the time on the other side of the world had any idea or any way of knowing that uh, it was a volcanic eruption they had to think it was the a wrath of God. The Nan Shi, which is a, it's a 6th century Chinese chronicle, described a, a, quote, yellow ash-like substance that rained from the sky, creating dust that a person could scoop with their hands. Michael the Syrian, he was a Byzantine scribe, wrote, The sun became dark, and its darkness lasted for 18 months. Each day it shone for about four hours, and still this light was only a feeble shadow. Everyone declared that the sun would never recover its full light. The fruits did not ripen, and the wine tasted like sour grapes. Fruit and vegetable crops need sunlight to grow, so widespread famine came as a result of such limited sunlight. Also, the lacking sunshine made it too, just simply too cold for the crops to grow properly. Um, earth, earth temperatures plummeted, and the crops wouldn't grow like they needed to, so it uh, brought on a, a massive famine. And to make the matters even worse, there's chronicles of, a southern di of the southern dynasties in China 
they reported of a rare summer weather event in which a heavy midsummer frost came and then a, a, storm, a snowstorm in August that just destroyed all the crops before they could be harvested. So the crops losses threw the cities into a famine that uh, lasted for two years and destroyed 70 to 80 percent of the population in that region, in that area. Furthermore, the lack of sunshine resulted in a severe vitamin D deficiency, making people susceptible to a plague that would take out approximately 50 million people. Think about the people living during this time. What must they have been thinking? Surely this is God's wrath. This is the end. We're all going to die. And uh, maybe that's the spiritual component of it. Maybe there's a scientific component that others tried to bring to it that says the sun is burning out. What do you do when the sun is burning up? They, uh, they were convinced that the sun wasn't going to come back. But given, con- given the perspective of either vantage point, what hope could they have for the future? It just feels like impending doom. So much uncertainty. Why would you bring a child into this world? Why would you ha- get married? Why would you move forward in your life? How do we make plans? What hope do I have? We're done, right? And as you look back on that, it was a, it was a volcanic eruption. So... Anyway, thankfully, this isn't the year 536, but uh, much like that year, we are, I think the common denominator that we're faced with and, and surely happened in 536 is this sense of uncertainty, and what, what I thought I knew to be true isn't necessarily stable, it's not necessarily true, and, and what is true? So I think it leaves us asking those questions, those can be good questions to ask. So today, if I could uh, dive into that. What do we do with that? What do we, uh, where can we find truth? Where can we find hope today? So that's what I want to dive into a little bit And uh, as we get started. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. I just thank you for the privilege we have to study your word together. I thank you for the privilege we have to meet together. I thank you, Lord, for the work that you're doing in all of our lives. Thank you that you are ever present. Uh, you, you're, you love us always in spite of whatever circumstances we're dealing with. Uh, you are here with us. So I, I thank you for this time. I do want to ask, Lord, that you would uh, use my mouth for your glory, your purposes, that you would uh, communicate through me effectively today and help me, Lord, to make much of you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, so much of the Christian life is about trusting God and pressing forward with him even when the world around us doesn't make sense. That's the life of a Christian. Think of going back to the beginning, um, not the very beginning, but with Abraham. God told Abraham that he would be the father of many nations, and uh, that his, his, his children would be as numerous as the sand on the seashore, and then uh, nothing happens. And Abraham proceeds to take matters into his own hands, has, has a, a child with, with uh, his wife's servant, and they have a child, Ishmael, and uh, take matters into his own hands. It's not really what God had in mind at all. 20, 30 years later, they actually get pregnant. Uh, Sarah gets pregnant at 90, and uh, Abraham's 100 years old at that point, and they have, they had uh, Isaac. And uh, a few years later, it, so everything seems like it's going well. I finally got my son. Somehow I'm going to be the father of many nations. Here's my one son to show for it. And God tells Abraham, I want your son. And he wants him to sacrifice his son at the altar, and, and Abraham willingly uh, took his son to sacrifice his own son. God intervenes, he provides the ram in the thicket, and uh, he doesn't have to sacrifice Isaac. But then Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau, they didn't get along, and that's Abraham's life. That's all he got to see. So God gives him this promise, and he gets to see one son born and then two others. And probably the, you're wondering, okay, well, what are you doing here, God? Like, I, I, you know, I, it seems like if you hear that, you're going to, that means you're going to have 10 or 20 kids. Well, he had one son. And then he got to see two grandsons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob would have 12 sons who would become what are referred to in Scripture as the Israelites. One of his sons was Joseph, who through a series of unfortunate events ended up in Egypt. And God used Joseph in Egypt to bring his family there uh, to sustain them during a severe famine. We're going to fast forward 400 years now. They're in Egypt, and Jacob's family has become very large. Uh, they're the Israelite tribe. They become a very large people group, roughly six million, three to six million. Um, the Egyptians did not like the Israelites, and they subjected them to harsh slavery. God used Moses to perform. So, so they are, uh, yeah, they're being persecuted. They're, they're slaves. They're being beaten. They're, um, it's, it's rough. And then God uses Moses 
to actually perform a number of miracles, ten miracles, to uh, demanding Pharaoh to let his people go. And uh, so God does that. Finally, um, as we know, he, he, God takes the firstborn sons of the people of Egypt, and uh, Pharaoh says, get out of here, leave. And uh, so they journey from Egypt and now in, into the wilderness. So as they leave Egypt, they travel day and night, and they kind of go down the core, and, and, and everything, they're traveling, they're, they're booking it, they're old people, aren't getting, their knees aren't getting sore, their feet aren't wearing out, they're not getting blisters, their shoes aren't wearing out, and they're booking it like day and night. God gives them supernatural strength, they're, they are cruising. And uh, they get to a place where they're kind of landlocked, the, the mountains are really, are really uh, uh, difficult to, co- to cover that terrain with that many people. They got the sea all the way around them, and then Pharaoh finds out, and he says, I'm going to take them back. So he sends out thousands of people, hundreds of chariots and horses, and, and he wants to annihilate the Israelites. So they're kind of stuck here, kind of headed back, and he wants to come down and just obliterate them. So that's his plan. And uh, so up to this point, the Israelites have seen 10 miracles that are evidence in, in God's work to, to make Pharaoh to let him go. Okay, so they're, they've already seen a lot. There's all the evidence that God's doing some things. We're just talking a few days that they've been gone now. And we're going to pick up in Exodus 14. If you do have your Bibles, we're going to cover a lot of scriptures. Of the, um, uh, a lot of it's story type of scripture, so it would be good to follow along. We'll also have it up here as well. But we're going to cover a lot of scripture in Exodus today. Exodus 14. So the people are... They're really just trying to escape, and they realize they're kind of landlocked, and, and Pharaoh's coming after them. Okay? So here we are, Exodus 14, verses 10 through 16. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what, we, what you, we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone, and we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Verse 15, The Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward, lift up your staff, Stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. Let the people of Israel, that, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on di- dry ground. So the people have just seen this 10 miracles, a sequence of miracles. They're going and they say, okay, look what, Moses, why did you bring us to this point? We're all going to die. Let's continue in verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. So the waters were divided, literally divided, a wall on each side um, for millions of people to come through, from walking through, and it took several hours to cover this, to go through the sea. So it was literally divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them, to the right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. So they're chasing them through the sea. They're going to go get them. They're very angry. They want them. And in the morning, and in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. They're like, uh-oh, seen this happen before. This has already happened 10 times earlier. This isn't good. Let us flee them, flee, flee from before Israel. Verse 26, And the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. So he separates the sea. The, the Israelites walk through on dry ground. The armies are chasing in after them and uh, having some issues with their, with their chariots, having some other issues. They know it's the Lord. And then uh, Moses puts his hand out, his staff out, and the sea just fills back in with them, them in the middle of it. So they're in, they're in a world of hurt. They're all going to die. The waters return, verse 28, the waters return, covered the chariots and the horsemen, on all the hosts 
of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. They all died. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Verse 31 I want to make much of here. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. We see God doing a work in our lives often, and, and it, it strengthens our faith, and it helps us to grow. We see God at work in other people's lives, and we get to see that in action. It strengthens our faith, and it strengthens them as well. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, and they feared the Lord. They believed in the Lord and, and in Moses. What's interesting is what happens just a few days later, though. And I want you to, I'm not here to criticize the Israelites so much as to, these are just normal people just like you and I, so prone to this. Exodus 15, 22 through 27. So they, they, uh, um, they kind of camped out there for a little while on the edge of the Red Sea. And then, uh, and then uh, verse, 15, or verse 22, chapter 15, then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea. It's time to leave. We need to leave camp. We need to go. And they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness, and they found no water. Now, three days is a long time to go with no water when you're doing a lot of walking and hiking. I'll grant that. When they came to Merah, they could not drink the water of Merah, Merah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Merah, Merah, Merah whatever it was. And the people grumbled, and here we go again, the people grumbled against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log, and he threw the log into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and do that which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments, and keep his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. God's saying, listen to me, obey me, I will take care of you. In case you didn't already know this from the 10 other miracles we did from crossing the Red Sea just a few days ago, I'm going to take care of this. Verse 27, then they came to Elam where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees and they camped there by the water. They hung out there for a few days. There's this common theme that's going to happen in, in the Exodus. People lose hope and they panic. The unexpected, they can't handle it and they panic. God responds in loving patience. Uh, by providing, and in some cases he responds in a loving discipline that says, come on guys, we keep talking about this over and over again. It's time to obey. So there's this peop then people turn back to God. God reminds the people to obey him and trust him. I've got this, is what God keeps saying. Exodus 16, verses 1 through 4. They set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. So they're just talking less than 50 days here that they've been gone. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Here we go again. And the people said of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the fool. They were slaves. We had us so good in Egypt sat by the meat pots and ate bread of the full, for you brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. So God says he's going to provide manna for them. Verse 35, The people of Israel ate the manna for 40 years till they came to a habitable land. They ate the manna till they came to the border of the land of Canaan. So manna actually rained down from the sky overnight. They gathered it in the morning. It was enough for one day. If they tried to keep it too long, it would spoil. So on Saturday, they could gather enough for two days, and it wouldn't spoil on Saturday because the Sunday, it was actually, it would have been Friday, I guess. The seventh day, they're to rest, and, uh, and, and, and so it would, it would be okay on the Sabbath to store enough for the Sabbath, but beyond that, it would be only be enough for one day. Bread rained down from the sky, manna. Exodus 17, God, so God cared for them. Exodus 17, verses 1 through 7. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord and camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? As if God hasn't provided already, they're, they're doubting again. There's so much uncertainty. 
So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They're almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? It's so easy. When life gets hard, it's so easy to doubt God's goodness and doubt his care for us. They had seen it. It's so easy for us to look at these people and say, how could you keep failing to trust God? Who are these people? Continuing in 17, chapter 17, verse 8, uh, the Amalekites, um, they're going to they're gonna tangle with the Israelites here. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek, while Moses, Hur, and Aaron went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed, and whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. While Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side, so his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with his sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is my banner, saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. God says, you're going to tangle with Amalek, you need me. I want you to do one thing. I want you to hold your arms up, and when you're holding them up, you're going to win. But then furthermore, he says, Moses brings in some guys, uh, Aaron and Hur, to help him. They eagerly helped him, helped him and, and it, it worked. And Joshua, Joshua's army won the battle. But then God says, remember this. Like, build an altar and uh, remember, basically remember this. Tell the stories from generation to generation, how you defeated Amalek. Because we always have to restore our minds, just refresh our minds. The Lord is there again and again and again. Let's continue Exodus 32, chapter 32. So they're, they're a little bit longer into this. They're not terribly long into this. Um, I'm thinking like about a year at best. And uh, so Moses is on Mount Sinai, and he's meeting with God on Mount Sinai. He's gone for 40 days. So in Exodus chapter 32... When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. And for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. What are we doing? How grieving that got to be to God's heart. Like, what? Um, they made a calf. <laughs> they made a golden calf, and they worshiped the golden calf because all of these things that God did to carry them through, miracle after miracle, time after time that he provides for them, cares for them, loves them, redirects them, they make a calf, and they worship a calf. And say, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Well, how grieving that is to God. Numbers 11, 1 through 6. There's a period of wandering in the desert now. And uh, God's doing a redemptive work in their hearts. The people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. And appropriately so, when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some outlying parts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down. So the name of that place was called uh, Taberah, because the fire of the Lord burned among them. Now the rabble that was among them had a strong craving, and the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Verses 18 through 20, this is God talking now. Say to the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the hearing of the Lord, saying, who will give us meat to eat? 
for it was better for us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. You shall not eat just one day or two days, five days or ten days or twenty days, but a whole month. Kids, check this out. This is an awesome verse in the Bible. But a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you, because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wept before him, saying, Why did we come out of Egypt? So here are the, the Israelites again complaining. All we have is this manna. God's providing manna every single day. Manna is a miracle from the Lord, raining down from heaven. And they, t- they don't even care. Um, they're upset that they have to eat manna. All they get is manna. So God says, all right, you want some, you want some meat? I'll bring you some quail. And you're going to be overloaded with quail. You won't even know. What, there'll be so many you won't know what to do with. And you're going to eat so much meat that uh, you're actually going to be vomiting through your nose. It was not pleasant for them. Uh, Numbers 13, 30. So, that, so, yeah, so then a little bit later, they send some spies into the promised land. And uh, they, they know here's where they need to go, but they send some spies in there. They sent 12 spies, one from every tribe, and, uh, and, and they came back. Okay? And this is uh, Caleb and Joshua. You'll see why people are named Caleb and Joshua, so many of them in our church. Numbers 1330, but Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are, putting faith in their own selves. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. They're too big for us. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak who came from the Nephilim, and we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. Then in verse, chapter 14, one, verse 1, Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night, and all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, Let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Like, we've had enough of this. God's miracles, God taking care of us, all this stuff. Let's go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel. Verse 6, And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, The land which we pass through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the Lord, for they are bread for us. Their protection is removed from him, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Then all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Like, we've got to remember what God's doing. Numbers 21, 4 through 9. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way, surprised. And the, Lord, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? For no food, no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Here we go again. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, Repent, we've sinned, we've spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he would take away the serpents, the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. So um, God's starting to <laughs> demonstrate some discipline here to, again. Um, they wandered in the desert for 40 years. And this, this constant, we're, we don't know. Is God still here? Does God care about us? I'm, we don't know. It's uncertain. And uh, this happened for 40 years. And here at the end of this, they're getting ready to enter the promised land. And Moses is speaking to the, uh, to the Israelites. Deuteronomy 4. Uh, Moses is ending. It's at the end of his days. They're wrapping up here. Kind of some final charges to the Israelites before they go into the promised land. And, they're, and his whole generation, uh, that whole older generation, was not allowed to go into the promised land. Except for Joshua and Caleb. Because they just wouldn't trust God. Moses is speaking to them in uh, Deuteronomy 4. 
And now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I am teaching you, and do them that you may live and go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commands of the Lord your God that I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor, for the Lord your God destroyed from among you all the men who followed the Baal of Peor. But you who held fast to the Lord your God are all alive today. See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your grandchildren how in the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, the Lord said to me, Gather the people to me that I may let them hear my words so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth and that they may teach their children so. Their time in the desert was not meaningless. Their time in the desert was establishing these these, uh, experiences with God, establishing these miracles, establishing God's God's throne, God's deity in their lives. And... um, and then you've guessed, you must remember what God's done. You must cling to these things. Romans 8, 1 through 6, he's saying much the same. Uh, the whole commandment that I command you today, sh- you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you keep his commands or not. And he did humble you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you, you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. See, and remember this, your clothing did not wear out on you, your foot did not swell these 40 years of wandering, you no, didn't have any issues with your, your joints. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. So keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing him. Moses' kind of final charges to the, to the Israelites Cling to the Lord, remember what he's done, follow his commands, and he's with you. The same, that same message doesn't change over 40 years. Joshua 1, so now it's um, time for Joshua to lead now. They're entering into the promised land, about to go, and God is now speaking to Joshua, and he's giving him some, some uh, charges, the commands. This is how it's going to be, bud. No man, verse one, chapter 1, verse 5 through 9, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do everything, or being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous, Joshua. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God's telling Joshua the same thing I told Moses, the same thing I've, I'm, I'm, all of these 40 years, the same thing I've told him all before. God's message never changes. It hasn't changed since then. It hasn't changed today. It's the same message. Be strong and courageous. Don't be frightened. The Lord your God is with us wherever we go. So, 12 tribes in Israel. It just happened to be 12. But I want to give you 12 takeaways, 12 things to think about in, in light of all of this, in light of the uncertainty that le- we live in. They lived in uncertain times for 40 years. Hopefully, we have to deal with this for another few months. I hope they, uh, hope they have some plans. It may take much, probably could be much longer than that, but hopefully not 40 years. They wandered in the desert for 40 years, much uncertainty. So I want to take some things to consider on uncertain times. Number one, uncertainty about the things we have believed to be true makes us vulnerable to doubting God when we find out those things may or may not be true, when when that's questioned. So uncertainty about the things we believe to be true makes us vulnerable to doubting God. And Satan knows that. Uh, That's In fact, that's that's the first sin, Genesis 3.1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the beasts of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? 
Satan injects uncertainty to Adam and Eve. We're both there. They were both watching. Adam was watching. Did God actually say? 1 Peter 5.8 tells us, Be sober-minded and watchful. Your enemy, the devil, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Satan knows he can prey on you when you are living in uncertainty. And number two, and it's, it's times of uncertainty that also represent a prime opportunity for us to act in faith and grow in our faith. And I would say the main reason God had people wandering in the desert for 40 years before they could jump into the promised land is they didn't have the faith to, to trust God to win those battles, to fight those battles for them. They had to learn to yield to God. So miracle after miracle after miracle, we saw most of the people didn't trust God. And uh, we, can, we can say, well, how did they miss that? And they were slaves. They, were, they had a miserable life in Egypt. We actually have a pretty good life here in America. We're living in Disneyland, right? It's pretty hard to know why you would need a Savior when our lives are already this good on earth. And so when you take that away, and God's leading us to the, <laughs> our eternal promised land, God's leading us, walking with us, and there with us, it's easy to say, well, God, why are you doing this? Why are you taking away my comfort? Why are you taking away whatever? And uh, so I have no interest in bashing the Israelites. I think it's a, it's a great case study in mankind. It's a great case study in the brokenness of mankind. You have people that lived in slavery, lived in bondage, um, extremely abusive situation that they wanted to go back. And they, well, well, it was so we had it so good. And how much do we want this world? And how much of our frustration with the uncertainty we're living in is related to the fact that our peace at, in the world has been shaken. Our hope in the world has been shaken. Our trust in the world has been shaken. So... Anyway, I think about that song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. We sing that often, but there's a verse that says, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. So powerful. But again, uncertainty is an opportunity to act in faith, and it's an opportunity to grow in our faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. It's, it's a being sure of what we hope for. It's a conviction, it's an assurance that what we hope for is get, that God is there, He's with us, He's going to take care of us. So let's take that opportunity to grow by faith. Number three, God is pleased when we live by faith in Him. Hebrews 11, 6-12 says, And without faith it is impossible to please God, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith Abraham, we talked about this a little bit, obeyed when he was called out to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. He had no idea where he was going, completely uncertain. His whole, everyone that went with him, they had no idea where they were going other than they're following God. By faith he went to live in the land of promises, in a foreign land living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. So he went from Abraham was loaded. He had a stash. He was, he had, he's one of the richest men in the land, and he lived in tents. He, lived in, um, he just went into a foreign land, lived in tents with his family, um, heirs of the promise. Verse 10, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Verse 11, by faith, Abraham, or Sarah, her, uh, Abraham's wife, herself received power to conceive when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Twelve, therefore, one man and him as good as dead were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the numerous or as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Through one man came the whole tribe of Israel. But also through that one man is a again, he didn't get to see it in his lifetime. He had one son and two grandkids. Number four, we can believe and hope with certainty in the fact that God never changes. That's one thing we can be certain of. Hebrews 13, 5 through 8 says, Keep your, li your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The reason he's talking about money here, I believe, is that our, our tendency is to put our hope in money. Our money is going to take care of our problems. Money is going to bring us stability. Money is going to uh, bring us joy. Money is going to take care of our issues. So 
God says to keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. God will never leave us. God will never forsake us. Verse 6, we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. God's our helper. He's our provider. He's our protector. Our hope is in Him. What can man do to us if God is helping us? If our money is helping us, I don't care how many guns you have in your closet. I don't care what kind of shields you have. I don't care if, if, it's, if you're going to go, you're going to go. We need the Lord to protect us. The Lord is our protector. He's our provider. Our hope is in Him. Verse 7, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. He said, hey, you know, Moses would be a good example. Here's a guy that lived following God. And uh, did he do everything right all the time? No. But he lived following God. Consider the outcome of their life. Consider, consider Joshua and Caleb and how the Lord worked in their lives and what, what it looked like to obey him and follow God. But furthermore, I, I appreciate this too. It's almost like verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. But he's talking about remembering your leaders, consider their way of life. And then he's almost like saying, yeah, I know what you're thinking. They're not all perfect. Verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus Christ is unchanging. We can be certain of that. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. First Peter 1.25 says, The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Forever. Unchanging. That's where we can put our hope, and the unchanging hope of Christ. Verse 5, for we're, we're designed for, not verse 5, but point 5, we're designed for relationships. We need each other, and we're not designed to go through this life alone. I read this earlier in, in Exodus 17, but we're, uh, they're fighting, fighting Amalek. And when Moses held up his arms, things were going well. When he lets his arms down, they don't go well. And Aaron and Hur, his, 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 his literal brother and, and uh, certainly a friend, and Hur, they went to the top of the hill. They gave him a seat to sit down in, and they, and they held up his arms as long as they needed to hold him up. And I've said this often, but man, I, I'm so blessed. Um, Heather and I feel so blessed by our church. And I feel so many times, I've told you some of you guys this, but man, it feels like you guys are like, what do you need me to do? You need me to hold your hand up, like hold your arm up, literally? And you, and you would. I'm so thank, thankful for you guys, so faithful in that. And uh, because it's, and, and I'm not certainly, um, if, 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 if that's what's needed, <laughs> you would hold our arms up. So thank you, thank you, people. Number six, God loves you and he cares for you. Stop trying to carry a burden that's not yours to carry. Matthew 6, 25 to 34 says, Therefore I tell you, don't be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more, more valuable than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we drink? What shall we eat? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So don't try to carry a burden that's not yours to carry. God loves you. He cares for you. And he's in this. Seven, stop burdening yourself with the unknown. It's another burden that's not yours to carry. Give those burdens to God. Psalm 55, 22 says, Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and and supplication with thanksgiving, let requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Don't burden yourself with the unknown. We can't control it. We don't need to burden ourselves with it. Number eight, God is leading us. God will lead you. And it's wise to make plans. We can't put our love, we can't love those plans. We can't put our hope in those plans. They're plans. But we must love God above all of our plans. Plans always yield to God's plans for us. But you must, so we must follow God first. Psalm 32, 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. 
I love this. Uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Your own understanding is fickle. Depending on how you're feeling in the moment, uh, we, the understanding we saw all through uh, the Israelites wandering in the desert, it's fickle. They don't know what they're thinking. We don't know what we're thinking. You can't trust your own understanding. We really get confused. We start doubting. We start fears. Everything sets in. Don't lean on your own understanding. Acknowledge God, and He will straighten your paths. James 4, 13 through 15 says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow, we'll go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you don't know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you should say, If the Lord wills, we'll live here, do this, do that. It's okay to make a plan, but when we put our hopes in our plans, what our marriage is going to look like, how many kids we're going to have, what the kids are going to look like, what kind of house we're going to live in, what kind of job we're going to have, how much money we're going to make, how many credentials we're going to have, how many friends we have, whatever. When you put your hope in your plans, it's going to, be, it's going to leave you really sad, depressed. <laughs> um, if the Lord wills, this is, hey, this is where we think we're going to go. If the Lord wills, we're going to go there. But you know what? We're following God. Number nine, God has power, all power over all things. He's always fully in control. Psalm 46, 1 through 3 says, God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, though we are dealing with a pandemic. God is our refuge and strength. He continued later on in uh, verse 8, 40, Psalm 46, Behold the works of the Lord. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. God's all-powerful. He's always in control. He's to always got this. There's nothing sneaking by him. He's not confused. He's not. These aren't unanswered. Like he knew this pandemic was going to happen. He knew the riots would happen. He knew the dysfunction in your personal life was going to happen. He knew all of these things. The beauty of Romans of this, the tenth verse, tenth one, tenth point is nothing can separate us from God and His love for us. Nothing. Romans eight thirty seven to thirty eight. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. Number 11, God is using circumstances in our lives for our good and for His glory. These trials are designed to bring us to Him and to do a sanctifying work in our lives. James 1, 2 through 4 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Philippians 1, 6, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 28, We know that all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Final point I want to make is our real home is not here. Our real home is in heaven. Our time on earth is essentially, in the grand scheme of eternity, our time on earth is like a little short mission trip. And we don't get to see what all happens when we go on a short-term mission trip. We try to plant a few seeds, but we normally don't get to see the outcome of that. In the grand scheme of eternities, our lives are a short-term mission trip here on earth. You probably won't recognize everything God's doing in and through you, just as he didn't re we didn't recognize that through Abraham. I want to continue in Hebrews 11. It's the faith chapter, as we know. And just close with this. Hebrews 11, 13. Um, and we'll continue onward. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they'd been thinking of that land from which they'd gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as, as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did. 
By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention to the exodus of the Israelites. He mentioned that it's going to happen in 400, he didn't, 400 years later it happened, but he made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones where he wanted to be buried. My, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Moses considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. You've got to be eternally minded. Verse 27, by faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and the prophets. I could say, name so many of you people in our church by faith, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. I am uncertain of what the long-term future is for our lifetime, I don't know. This is pretty cool, though. There's some people that laid it all out there, and I hope we will too, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. We're all part of the grander plan. We are all part, we're all in this. And, uh, we all play a role in this. So, those things that, are, that we, we talked about, our real home is in heaven. Um, God's using these circumstances in our lives for his good and our glory. Nothing can separate us from God and his love for us. God has power over all things. God will lead you. He will lead us. He's leading you. Stop burdening yourself with the unknown. God loves you. He cares for you. We're designed for relationship. We need each other. Don't, don't miss that. We can believe in hope and certainty in the fact that God never changes. God is pleased when we live by faith in Him. Times of uncertainty also represent a prime opportunity for us to act in faith. So uncertainty allows, pushes us to act in faith and grow in our faith. But also we need to know that uncertainty brings up a certain amount of vulnerability, of uh, susceptibility to sin in us. So we need to be aware of those things. Let's we'll spend a little bit of time in prayer now. And I just ask you to examine your own hearts. We're going to take communion here in a little bit too. And in this time of examination, what is stirring your heart? What is, we all deal with uncertainty, and the uncertainty is not the sin, but how do we respond to that uncertainty? So there's some things in your world, in your life, that are stirring your heart. And what is stirring stirring your heart? What are you believing? What lies might you be believing about who God is? Uh, It should be no surprise that you might doubt God here and there. The Israelites did it through and through and through. If you're struggling with doubt, if you're struggling, if you in the middle of a situation where you need to repent, uh, will you trust God? So what areas do you need to yield to God? So as part of this uh, uh, time of communion as well, but just examine your heart. Um, and uh, where are you not trusting God? What are you uncertain about? What's, what are you conflicted about? Uh, then... In terms of communion, we, we do take, uh, like on the first Sunday, we like to uh, provide an opportunity for other believers to put their hope in Christ uh, to take part in communion. This is uh, um, gluten-free crackers and uh, grape juice. But uh, Jesus said, it's my blood and my body. Take, eat, this is my body. And uh, drink the blood, take the cup. So um, just an opportunity for, for believers who put their faith in Him uh, to worship 
in communion. So I want to allow that too. And uh, let's pray. Lord, thank you for today, and just thank you for the opportunity we have to meet together. I thank you, Lord, in uncertain times that we can know that you are certain, that you are the same yesterday and today and forever. I thank you that you love us, you care for us, that you're always there, that you're in charge, that nothing is too big for you. This, none of this surprises you. Nothing we're dealing with is a surprise. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Please guide and direct our time as we examine our hearts, examine our, our, our minds. Lord, um, help us to yield to you. Help us to not put hope in our plans, but in your plans. Uh, to yield to you whatever that needs to look like, Lord. Bring us to, uh, help us to repent of the things that we need to repent of, and, and again, yield to you where we need to yield. We love you. Thank you and praise you for this time.